Welcome to the Geotechnical Investigation class for the Highway Structure Inspection Level 1 a series that we have here at the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. Hope you've enjoyed our videos so far. If you haven't seen the first few, go back and check those out on bridge types, components, and staking and layout. And then after this, we've got several more. So what do we need to know for geotechnical investigation? What you're going to need to know more is soil samples and rock cores. You're going to see these on your geotech plans uh, for your bridge job, and you need to be able to interpret them. What are those N values? What is that CL? What is a QU, an LI, or a Kentucky RQD? Through this session, we're going to walk through these, show you where to find them on the plans, and tell you what they mean. Also, with rock soundings and observation wells, uh, you'll see this here. This is a rock sounding and a well. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So the topics of this class, boring layout, soil sampling and properties, groundwater, where is it, what is it, how does it affect our job, rock sampling and properties, and then the subsurface data sheets in the plans and how do we use those and what is your role with those as the inspector. So boring layout, we'll get started. So you'll see first few sheets, uh, usually S4 or so in your bridge plans will be your boring layout. It'll give you center line of bridge with stations, and then at each uh, substructure location, so in-bent or abutment, pier one, pier two, so on, they'll show those on the boring layout. Typically, they'll do borings or auger refusals at every substructure unit. Here we did two at pier number one. An open circle is just a refusal. A shaded in circle inside a larger circle is a core hole. And here you can see this is core hole number five. If you go down here to hole station number five, it gives you all the information. It's at station 12 plus not not. It was taken 20 foot left of center line. The elevation of ground line when they drilled was 522.88 or eight. And then you see what type of soil it was. We'll talk more about that later, but at six, it was just a boring to refusal. And as you see that here, same information, 12, now 20 foot right. Had a different starting elevation, but there would be a refusal elevation down here. So why do we take soil samples? We need to sample it to be able to classify it. Our designers need to know what's there to know how to design the bridge. As the inspector, you need to know what's there to know how to come use this soil to backfill the bridge. You need to know what the moisture content, especially the contractor needs to know what the moisture content is to whether or not they'll need a coffer dam or shoring. Uh, we'll need to monitor your content if you're doing backfill with soil. And then also the strength. What is it going to do when we backfill with it? We get soil samples by Shelby tubes. We drive the tubes in the ground to get our sample. Also, we have the standard penetration test. We drive a rod down into the ground with a set weighted hammer with a set fall on it. And we record the number of blows that it takes to advance the last 12 inches. So, And then we record those as an N value on your plans. So if you look what that N value represents, so N blows per foot of zero to four is a very loose if you're in a sand and gravel or if you're in silt and clay, a soft to a very soft. If you move down to we'll say a N value of 10 to 30, you're in a medium density sand and gravel or a stiff to very stiff silt and clay. So these will kind of help you determine an easy value of just the end, what type of material you're working with. You can see here outside the core sample, the end value at this elevation is at 20. Five feet down at the elevation, it's 35. It's telling you we're more and more dense soil the further down you go. Here's what the samples look like in the lab before we test them. You got some waxed, undisturbed Shelby tube samples and then some disturbed SPT jar samples. All right, so what are our soil types? If you look at the unified system, uh, you got the unified and ash toe. We're going to cover unified here. Uh, you can look more up that later on other videos or just kind of look on some ash toe different classification websites. Coarse grain soils are any soils that are retained on a number 200 sieve. That new hum number 200 sieve is that magic sieve. It can actually hold water. But so anything above that's our gravels and our sands. 
anything that passes through that number 200 sieve is our fine grain soils of clay or silts. So this is our sieve analysis. As you can see, anything from a number four and up is considered a gravel, and anything from the number four and down is considered a sand, and then anything goes below, below the 200 sieve is a silt or a clay. To determine the difference in the silt and clay, we know silts are more gritty, clays are more putty-like, but we can run different tests. You can see a picture here of the Atterberg limits test and just doing a test in our hands, rolling it together to be able to determine, do we have a clay, do we have a silt? And there's more tests that can be run in the lab to determine actual percentages using a hydrometer and such. So here is a picture of the unified soil classification system chart. It would be good to know this because you know what these uh, initials are. So GW, GP, GM, GC. Uh, the GW is a gravel and it's well graded. You can see here well graded gravels. P is a poorly graded. So the same goes for sand, well graded, poorly graded. You get down in silts and clays, you're going to see L's and H's. That's low plasticity, high plasticity. If you need to know more about this, take our grade and drain class that we offer. Uh, this class goes way more into depth into this and is a, actually a prerequisite for this class uh, in person. So if you look, what is moisture content? Uh, if you can see here this diagram, we've got the S's labeled soil, the little bubbles with A's are air, and then everything in between is water. So we can weigh it, dry it, weigh it, dry it, and we can get that moisture content. How much water is actually in the soil? Water is a good thing in soil, but it's also a bad thing. If you have too little, it won't act right. If you have too much, it won't act right. But if you have just enough, it'll do exactly what it's supposed to do and give you the compaction to do your work. The unconfined compression test gives us a strength of our soil, just like we get a compressive strength of concrete, we can get a compressive strength of this soil. So we mold it together in a cylinder and then you break it, very similar. But as you'll notice, we got different values. Uh, medium to stiff is 1,000 to 4,000. And you think 4,000, that's pretty more than stiff on concrete. Well, on concrete, that's 4,000 PSI. On soil, that is 4,000 PSF, so pounds per square foot, much larger area to give you a much different consistency and density. So here, 4,000 PSF is a medium, is a stiff compressive strength, different than 4,000 PSI in concrete. So that is a QU. If you're looking on the plans, you can see the QU is going to be right outside here. It's to give us in this test, it's a 1,600 PSF and has a 32% water. Here you can see CL, if we remember back to our chart, that is a clay with a low plasticity. Here we have a sand that is poorly graded and a G that is well graded. Our N value here is 35, our N value here is 20. A cased observation well is what we're going to use to know where the water level is. So when they drill down for refusal on just an auger, drilling, they're going to pull one of these observation wells and then we'll measure where is the water table and check it over time to see how it fluctuates. The contractor needs to know this to know, do I need a cofferdam? Do I need extra shoring? What am I going to do to protect this excavation until I get my concrete poured and backfilled? So our rock sounding and observation well, so we're moving now from soil to rock sounding. Uh, rock sounding here, we've got similar thing. You've got in this instance, just a refusal. Uh, our auger refused at 507. We've drilled down and we've got the date. So that way the contractor knows it's probably in the wet season. We get more in June, July. That's going to lower as it dries out. Now rock sampling and properties. With this section, we're going to talk on rock coring, the rock quality designation of the RQD and the Kentucky RQD the slake durability index, and the geological description. So RQD, or rock quality designation, is the estimate of rock quality of in-place rock mass. From what I understand it, that is sections, sections that are four inches or larger get counted and gets a percentage of the total run of five feet. Kentucky RQD is we go in and we actually break those apart. Some of our shales we can break by hand, and we don't want to give those a high RQD count but they will hold together in the drilling. So we break them apart. 
the Kentucky RQD will be less than the standard RQD because of this. You can see this first picture here. You got a higher QD, RQD. You can see a lot of the rocks together. Big, long core run links. And then a lower RQD is the one that's all more broken up. So our rock quality descriptions. Uh, RQD 0 to 25 is very poor. And as you go increase your number, you increase your uh, quality up to excellent. All right, slake durability index is a lab test done on shales to determine their weathering. What is the degrading and slaking when those shales are exposed to water? Some of our shales are some pretty nasty stuff that'll just fade away into mud and almost straight water. But this is done, performed on shale, sometimes on sandstone, but mainly on shale. And we want to know what is the effect and we'll give it a rip value. So those values are 95 and up or below 95. 95 and up, we consider a durable shale. This is a good hard rock. We have good durable shales in the state, but we have a lot more non-durable shales in the state. These non-durable shales, we need to know how to waste them. If we are going to use them in our fills or bridge back fills, not the bridge back fill, but the fill leading up to it, we need to know what we need to do to it to make sure it's already slaked out before uh, we start loading even more on top of it. So if we're looking at our SDI values, you'll see here the shales denoted with frowny faces and smiley faces. This is an SDI 45, so we know that's a non-durable shale. Non-durable shales are denoted with this frowny face. Also note the Kentucky RQD is 10, much less than the recovery because we broke it up. This is a bad shale that breaks apart. You get further down to the hole, we got an SDI of 96. That's a durable shale denoted by the frowny face with the RQD closer to the recovery, 85 and 95. So this is a much stiffer, harder shale. Notice this JS here of two and five. This is called the jar slake test. It's a very subjective test of a rating one through five. You can do this, just stick a sample in a bucket in your truck and you can do a test on the shale right there to see what you have. Note here, we also have top of rock and then the base of weathered rock. That's what we're going to for our structure excavation, which we'll talk about in the next session. So soil and groundwater summary. We're using the unified soil classification system for gravel, sand, silt, and clays. Uh, the W percents for our moisture content, our unconfined compressive strength, our N is our SBT blow count. These line with the upside down triangle to mark, denotes the groundwater table. For a rock summary, RQD is a rock quality designation. The estimate of the rock in place. And then the SDIs are slake durability for shales and some sandstones. And here that gives you how, what the symbology is for limestone, sandstone, durable shale, which is greater than 95 on the SDI value, and non-durable, which is less than 95. And it's kind of backwards what you would think. Durable shale is denoted with frowny faces. Non-durable shale is denoted with smiley faces. And then R would give you the auger refusal. So we didn't take a core sample. We just drove down to rock and we stopped. So let's look at an example of a set of plans, full sheet. Here you got the subsurface data. We've got center line of bridge. We've got all of our core hole and auger refusal locations. Down here you see the indent pier one area and the different core numbers, the hole numbers, the station, the offset, and the elevations. So here, if we look at 1003, that comes to here, and we can go straight down to look at the core data. So a zoom in of that with all the whole locations and their locations based on stations. So let's look at 1003. Here we got the geological description for what it is. We can see here we have a limestone. Here we're into a poor quality shale denoted by the Art Kentucky RQD of 30. And also it's got a SDI of 92, that denotes it's a non-durable shale. The 3 for the jar slake also denotes a non-durable shale. But note, the whole number can trace back to that uh, pro plan sheet that we showed earlier. So it's a different sample, different set of bridge plans, but kind of gives you an idea. Here we've got an end value of this soil of 11. That is a stiff to very stiff, but barely. It starts at 10 and goes up to 40. Our moisture content is 21%. Here we know it's a clay by the CL. What else? This is a silt down into here. Notice your N value 
uh, increases up to a 26. And our base of our weather grok is 403.31. So this is at a pier. We're going to go down for our footer all the way down to the base of weather grok at 403. That is it for geotechnical investigation. I hope you watch the next video on structure excavation. Uh, if you learned anything from this, give me a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel for more uh, videos and training videos to come. Uh, if you have any questions, leave it in the comment and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible.